Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Well, today I'm going to share with you my experience in regard to PhD exam I passed in uh, 2015. And I want to share with you that essay that won me the PhD contest. Of course, as you know, you go to that exam and you most likely are going to write two essays. And well, of course, these two, two essays are going to determine, well, of course, your life in the future. Either you're going to be a PhD student and a doctor, or you fail and you try again. So these two essays usually are very crucial. And most of the time, our most students, they usually prepare these essays before they go. And in fact, this is what I have done because so many students now ask me, how did you revise and how, uh, how do you advise us to revise concerning the PhD contest? I will tell you what I did. I did simply, I was writing essays. I was writing and writing, trying to polish my, trying to polish my writing styles. And, and this, in fact, is really has really helped me. And when it comes to my writing style, it has become much better. But at the end, is what I did. I was, I was trying to write, write essays, try to predict questions that I, can, I, I may face when it comes to a PhD contest. So today I decided to share with you that essay that really, really changed my life. So what was it about and how did I answer it? Because of course, I'm not only going to share with you, in fact, how I was thinking, the, what, was, what was my strategy concerning my writing style. So let's begin first. The question that I got was, was I don't remember it, it was a matter of 2015, and it was mainly about eclecticism, but it was not 100% eclecticism, but it was, concerning whether any approach is good, like adhering to one approach in teaching is beneficial, or um, I think the question was like, there is not one single approach that is can help in the language teaching. As you can see, all these questions, they are most likely similar. So if you talk about eclecticism, if you talk about that there is no one single approach that can help, for example, if you talk about the use of uh, of combination of approaches in less than one session all these will in fact be answered in the same way well of course there's few differences but still we will have the same answer so let me review my essay with you what did i say i said for example i begin with the history of second language teaching as marked by numerous approaches and methods it's a cliche introduction uh, i do it all the time and often these methods come as a result of a general assumption about language and language teaching and the focus of specific skills. Okay, I have explained this because I do believe that I have shared this before this essay, but I just want I want uh, I want now to really try to shed light on how I did it, like the methodology I have chosen in answering. So you see that these methods come as a result of general assumption that because every that is the definition of an approach. Why do we need to approach? What is an approach? It's just a general assumption about language and language teaching. And the focus on specific skills, because you know, sometimes we have several methods and several approaches, approaches that uh, that emphasize specific, specific or specific skills. Now these approaches, this is what I wrote because most of the time these approaches prescribe a checklist for the teacher to follow in the classroom. Now this, this is my main idea. This is what I want really to stress here. However, given the complexity of learning and teaching context and the involvement of many variables, uh, like uh, many variables like learners' attitude, teachers' proficiency, objective and aims, and materials av availability, making any attempt to teach from the perspective of one method or an approach would be inconceivable. Now, as you can see here, I've said that the, the, it's a it's a complex process. What do we have in this process? I said first, involvement of many variables like learner's attitude, teacher's proficiency, objective and aims, materials availability. So these four that I have mentioned here, if you are going to ask me where is the thesis statement, this is the thesis statement. Now, if you are going to ask me where is the outline, this is the outline. What is the outline? The outline is the order of these elements. So if I mention these elements in specific order, I have to answer them in that specific order. So this is what we call an implicit outline in the thesis statement. As a solution to the, this issue, education was to advocate the use of an eclectic approach to language teaching. So this is also part of the thesis statement, and this is also the solution to what I'm saying. So let's have a look at my first 
uh, binary paragraph. So the first administrative constraint a teacher faces with any decision about teaching is the objective in the syllabus. So what I'm saying here that we have a syllabus that in fact controlling the teacher. So according to Willis 1990, the primary reason behind use of an eclectic approach is the conflict that arises between syllabus and methodology. So he asks that the syllabus and methodology can either complement or hinder each other. This idea, because I was a teacher and I know that teachers face this particular problem. Sometimes when you want to teach a lesson, either that lesson is going, you see that yes, yeah, beneficial, or sometimes you find that that lesson is very difficult to implement using like a certain a specific approach. So indeed, if the aim of the syllabus is to teach the structure of the language, how a teacher can achieve that through communicative approach. Now, let me tell you something that I wrote this in 2015. A lot of ideas have changed. My belief concerning language teaching has changed. So I would change this paragraph, but I just want to show you what I did at that time. Thus, instead of holding rigidly to the communicative approach, uh, uh, approach, a teacher can fall back to more traditional approaches to serve that particular aim in its syllabus. So here I said that teacher somebody has to be a flick, has to be flexible and has to, in fact, choose what kind of method and approach to teach a specific item, let's say, in the syllabus. So, moreover, even if the methodology and objective in the syllabus are unaligned, uh, unaligned the teacher can face difficulties in mixed ability class. So I said, I'm not contradicting, even what I said in the beginning, even if everything is good here, we can have mixed ability class. Every learner has his own attitude towards a foreign language. This is, remember, this is my second idea when I mentioned in my thesis statement. And each one has unique ways of learning. The so teacher has to be flexible to accommodate all this diversity. This diversity, because this that should not be there. Now, consequently, a single method may serve some learners while rendering others unlearned. Not sure if it's really correct, but I wrote it that time. For example, many teachers in rural areas, rural areas in Accra, I always advise that you give examples, you try to give you realistic examples that reflect your, really your experience. At that time, I was a teacher, so I was teaching in rural areas. It says that learners face problems with speaking skills and understanding grammatical uh, uh, grammatical rules implicitly. Because we were always told that you should teach grammar implicitly. And we know now that even in communicative approaches, there is a balance between, between what we teach implicitly and explicitly. Even we know that in communicative approaches, we need that explicit teaching of certain skills. So why they excel so while they excel when they are taught grammar explicitly, which unfortunately goes against many supervisors. The supervisors I hear I'm talking about inspectors. Uh, in Algeria, we know that for example, the inspectors or mentors, whatever you want to call them, if they visit you in your class and they find you that you're teaching a lesson grammar explicitly, sometimes you have a problem with that. Well, like most likely these days things have changed. But I do still hear problems concerning that. Additionally, similar to learners, this idea I have uttered, and I rarely hear about it. And I just because I do believe in this idea, but I wrote it. I said it's a risk, but I said okay, I should do it. Teachers also have their strengths and weaknesses. A teacher may do well in certain approaches and methods and fail to bring satisfactory results to others. Therefore, confining a teacher to a specific paradigm may have positive or probably negative outcomes. The eclectic approach can provide teachers with freedom and flexibility in teaching learning context. The idea that I developed here that sometimes we like learners, some teachers do better in certain with certain approaches and we don't do well with others. We find, for example, some teachers super active, they can use music, uh, and they can, let's say, for example, engage with the student. And we find some teachers, they are more of the lecturer type. For example, they like to speak, they control the class, the learners can listen, they do listen to them. So we have differences. And I think this freedom is very important. Uh, let me go outside of the topic. We hear today, for example, some teachers, they can teach in classes like 200 200 students and everyone can understand and we find some people criticizing them uh, criticizing them because they said okay it's impossible no it is possible you can teach 300 you can teach 200 as long as you are flexible and you can control your students because the approach and your way of teaching 
is uh, the, the approach and the way of teaching are aligned. So this is going to bring satisfactory result. Whereas when you go to classes, to our classes as teachers, the problem we are very, we don't have freedom, we are controlled. And this is usually causing us a lot of problems. So the second paragraph, in terms of material, because I mentioned that I, in my introduction that I'm going to talk about materials. In terms of materials, some methods are closely related to the use of specific materials. Now, obviously, you can see here, there is repetition. The issue, the issue is that government, maybe I should change government now, cannot ensure the availability of materials across all the schools. A good example can be seen in Algeria. While authorities insist on the use of materials, many schools, especially those in rural, area, rural areas, do not have access to required resources, which makes any method that relies on them uses. As you can see, my language was very simple back then, but still, it was a good essay. Thank you. On the other hand, sometimes circumstances oblige, obliges, uh, circumstances oblige the teacher to adapt a contingency plan, which involves the use of different approaches. For example, in a power failure, in the case of a power failure, which tends to occur also in remote regions. I do have, I used to have this problem always when I want to use my video projector. The, the, I have a power problem. Sometimes the plug doesn't work. Sometimes there is no electricity. Sometimes even there is no video projector. The other teacher took it. So you have a problem. So you need that contingency plan. This is what I said here in my essay. However, the adaptation of an eclectic approach in the classroom requires profound knowledge from the part of the teacher. Here I'm um, counter. Um, I given the counter argument that where is the problem with that? It often assumed that only teachers with good training can incorporate several approaches in their teaching. On the other hand, those who are given recipes of how to teach with no theoretical thinking about the advantages and drawbacks of approaches tend to be slave of textbooks. So this is the last paragraph. As you can see, the last paragraph, it was not in the term of a conclusion, it was like um, I'm trying to contradict myself so that there is a problem and if you are going to adapt this approach, of course, you need to be aware of the problems that it bears. So this is what I wrote. I will tell you that I prepared, I wrote this essay, I prepared it, I memorized it, I was ready, I designed this, I designed this, um, I designed this essay uh, maybe to cover several questions that may that I may face. In the same time, I was ready for this. So, and it was not the only essay. I think I have memorized like a lot of essays, and I went there. And this is how I do it. And if you are going to ask me how I'm going to revise, I'm going to say the same thing. Now, I just yesterday I posted the question: If you are not writing, you're not revising. So, what you need to do, you need to pick to pick up your pen and write. Answer questions, answer questions as much as possible. This, in fact, this piece of advice is not only for students who are going to pass the entrance, the PhD entrance exam, but also those students who are going to sit for their regular exams. Just write essays. And once you finish writing these essays, of course, you are going to memorize them. But trust me, just the fact that you have wrote, that you have, that you have written these essays, is that you have done also half of the job. This is so important to you. So, this is my experience. Of course, there will be coming video, inshallah. Uh, please, your questions really make me make me happy. The same thing concerning your comments, your encouragement. I need you to subscribe. I need you to follow this channel, my Facebook channel. Uh, with your support, inshallah, this channel is going to grow. So thank you so much, and see you on next video.